Is it going through okay? Okay. I will speak up a great amount. Oh, crikey. I'll probably first fix this. Okay, let's get going. Hopefully, there will be no echo. I feel like I've got the best spot. So there's no code demos now, because I can't reach my keyboard. So for this session, we're going to talk about RabbitMQ. Who here has used RabbitMQ? Okay, good, very few people. So there's gonna be a lot to learn. Um, my name's Rob Harrop. I was one of the co-founders of Spring Source a long, long time ago. I used to be a Spring Framework committer. I've worked on the Rabbit team for a little while. I'm, I've left Spring Source now. I'm in a new startup, a financial startup in London. So doing a lot of messaging, a lot of rest, a lot of you know, fancy kind of message passing stuff. So this is a subject that's very interesting to me. In particular, I'm interested in different languages and different protocols communicating because we like to write our systems in the language that makes the most sense for the particular problem we're trying to solve. So we're gonna see some basic RabbitMQ stuff. We're gonna look at the AMQP protocol, which is the core protocol supported by RabbitMQ. We're gonna look at a different protocol called Stomp. Stomp's getting quite popular right now. It's just a text-based messaging protocol supported by a load of different brokers including RabbitMQ, and it's a nice way of communicating with some different languages that don't have an AMQP binding. We're going to do some fancy web browser stuff. Um, very interested in rich clients in my new startup. We have web applications that are pretty much all client-side JavaScript, communicating via REST and WebSockets with the back end. So interested in Node.js and ways of doing messaging, proxies, sending messages to clients. So we'll see how we can do that. It's really quite simple. Going to do a lot of languages, um, Java, Python, Ruby, Erlang, JavaScript, and Haskell, we hope, in an hour. All the code is on Git, so if you just search my name on GitHub, uh, the presentations repository, all the, all the code is there for you to try, so you just need RabbitMQ running, it's really simple. RabbitMQ is a multi-protocol messaging broker. Really simple, it's nothing super fancy, it's just like a normal JMS broker, except it has its, a dedicated protocol. You don't interact with it at an API level, instead you have a protocol that you use. The broker itself supports AMQP at the core, but it will support any other protocol you care to add to it. And there are bindings in most languages. There's Java, there's .NET, there's Python, Ruby, PHP, so on and so forth. The Rabbit team themselves, look after the Java client, the .NET client, and the Erlang client, and for that reason, those are the better clients. Recently, they contracted the guy from the Ruby community, he was doing the Ruby client, and that is now a pretty fantastic client as well. And I think we're starting to see more and more people getting behind the Python clients and other clients, and we'll see some examples of that. AMQP is a different messaging protocol if you're used to JMS. And the key thing you can realize about AMQP, and if you take only one thing away from this talk, is that AMQP is not JMS. If you try to shoehorn AMQP into a JMS model, you're not going to be successful. You're going to come up against all manner of crazy things that you just think, why does it work that way? That's not how a queue works. That's not how a topic works. Because AMQP is different. Try to forget what you know about JMS, and let's relearn how messaging works, relearn the primitives, and we'll see how those primitives are composed in the AMQP system. There are two main things you need to know about, queues and exchanges. As a consumer of messages, you're connected to a queue. You get your messages from a queue. As a producer of messages, you send your messages to an exchange. And there's a routing table that governs how messages get from the exchange into one or more queues. Really simple. So at the consume side, we can have 
a stock price is Q, and we can have any number of consumers off the back of that, maybe even zero. A message is only consumed once. So if you have multiple consumers, the consumers don't see the same messages, they just see different messages in a kind of round robin fashion. If you want to send messages to multiple consumers, you can have multiple queues. At the produce side, we have producers firing messages into an exchange, and the messages are annotated with something called a routing key. And it's this routing key that governs where the messages are sent to, to which queues are they sent. And the way we do that is with this notion of a binding. A binding says, for this set of routing keys, please route the messages to these queues. Very simple. So it's all decoupled. You can have producers and exchanges, you can have consumers and queues, and you can have bindings completely separately. You can have a consumer have its own queue, and you can have multiple producers publishing to that via many different exchanges and many different bindings. So it's a really flexible graph of, of routing. There are different kinds of exchange that govern how the routing keys are interpreted. The most commonly used one is the direct exchange. This just says, here's a name, and then bind to that queue for foo. So if I publish a mes message with that key, it will go to that queue that's bound under that name. Topic routing is the kind of familiar patterns that we've seen with stars and with uh, percent signs that kind of govern hierarchical routing topics. Very simple, but not the kind of topic-based pub sub-subscriptions we've seen from, Java, from um, JMS. That's not what a topic is in AMQP. It's probably the biggest area of confusion. People conflate the pub sub aspect of topics in JMS and the pattern style routing with topics in AMQP, which are just the pattern-based routing. There are loads more exchange types. Those are the two most common ones. You can build your own if you want to. You probably don't want to. That's all the slides. That's not the end of the presentation. What I want to do now is just let's dive into some code, because if we show you the code, we can see how the queues work, and we can see it all hanging together. So I'm going to start by building a publisher in Java. And the API is going to look very, very familiar at first. We start with a connection factory. I can't even find my keys. And we can share these in Spring if you want to, you know, make them uh, beans we can inject with. And we just need to set up the username and password. Uh, default is guest in RabbitMQ. So password, same again. Once we've got that, we can get a connection. So we can factory.create new connection. And that gives us the connection. And then this is a model that's quite different from JMS. The connection isn't what you actually interact with. Connections are multiplexed. So you can have multiple channels running over the connection. For most cases, it's just not worth thinking about this. Create a connection, create a channel, run with it. You don't really need to worry too much about what's happening there. The key thing, however, is that channels are not thread safe, so you shouldn't really share them amongst different threads. It is now safe to do that with the Java client because the Java client adds extra synchronization in the background, but conceptually, an AMQP channel is not thread safe. So we can create a channel from the connection. Each create channel, nice consistency there. New connection, create channel. And once we've got that, we can create a queue. We want to create a queue that we can publish to, and we want to create an exchange, sorry, an exchange that we can publish to, and a queue that we can consume from. So let's start by just publishing some messages. And what I want to do is I want to publish many messages in the background kind of continuously in a thread. So I can create a thread. And I'm gonna run a publish task in the background. Then I want to uh, start that thread wait for some input, and stop the command, and then wait for the thread to finish. Interrupt. And then just close the connection. And what I need to do is, because I'm gonna use the channel here in the publish task, I'll pass that in. So this is just a simple runnable. I'm just gonna run this task continuously for as, as long as needs to be. Um, what I want to do is every tick of the run is generate a message and send it. So I'm gonna, I've got a little utility called price generator that's just gonna generate some random stock prices for me. And then while we're not interrupted, we'll just keep running this loop. So if we 
trigger interrupt now. We're going to stop the thread. And now we can start actually doing something. So I'm going to just write this out uh, so we can see it working. And then with the channel, we can do a, uh, a basic publish. So this is one of the verbs that exists in the MQP protocol, which is a basic publish. And the first argument here is the exchange. There's a default exchange that exists in MQP, which is the empty name. And we're going to use that for now, and I'll explain how that works in a second. The second argument is the routing key. So we want to use the stock prices routing key. Then we can put any properties in there that we want, any kind of special things. We're going to leave that null. And then finally, the payload, so just the bytes of the message. And then I just want to uh, thread sleep for 500 milliseconds. I don't want to publish too many. And obviously, we need to um, get a try catch here just to. Uh, So many IDEs, so many key shortcuts. If it's interrupted, I want to correct. Get rid of that. And then I just want to add the other star trace here. So, very simple. We're going to tick in a thread. Every 500 milliseconds, we're going to publish a message. We're going to publish it to the default exchange with the routing key stock prices, and that's all we're going to do. So let's see if that works. So that's running away now, generating some stock tickers, and publishing those messages in the background. No one's consuming them. In fact, there are no queues, so we've got nowhere for them to go. But we can start to see what this looks like in the broker. So RabbitMQ comes with a nice management console that looks like this. And we can kind of see like the publish rate here, two messages a second, which is but there are no queues. There's only the basic set of exchanges. We've got our channel that we saw before, and we've got our connection. So they can get some really nice insight into what is going on in the broker. What we want to do now is to start consuming those messages somewhere else. So we can build a consumer. So it's very simple, kind of similar model. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. We just need to roughly the same code in here, so I'm just going to copy it to kind of connect in. So this will give us another connection and another channel in a different process now. And what I want to do now is create myself a queue. So this is really different than JMS, is that there's actual verbs involved with creating queues, creating bindings, which we'll see is, is very different. I'm going to give it a name stock prices, which matches the routing key we're using in the other example. And then this very crazy set of uh, parameters here, which we're just going to leave as false, false, true, null. Um, I'll explain those to you in a second. And then that's given us a queue. When that method is finished, we know that queue exists in the broker. And now I want to start consuming from it. So I can create this queuing consumer. the channel and I can start consuming off that now and I want to do that in another thread so we have to tell the rabbit broker that we want to start consuming um, give it a key stock prices and uh, which consumer and now it's going to start notifying that consumer when messages become available it's doing that in the background using like a blocking queue structure so to consume off that we could do it in the thread or we can do it in another thread which is the nicest way I think to do it so we can create a thread here Consumer, no, sorry. And then just start that. And I want to wait again for some input before I stop it. Then I want to wait for the thread to stop. And then I'm going to close the connection down. If you close the connection down, you close the channel implicitly, so you don't need to worry about closing both down. Okay, we're missing the thread interrupt there. And let's go to the consumer task and see what that's going to do. It's very simple. All we're going to do is basically run over everything that's in that queuing consumer. So while we're not interrupted, uh, 
next delivery gives us the object that represents the message. So it gives us this delivery object. And then we can do uh, the message is huge string delivery dot body. So that's how we construct the message out of that. Obviously, we're getting an error here because we have a, an interrupt of operation. So let's just wrap that up again. And what I want to do is just print out the message here. So this consumer, very simple, connect the broker, create a queue called stock prices, can create a consumer on the queue stock prices for this consumer object, and then run that in the background thread. Really easy. We can, we can press that down and give this a run. And you can see it's starting to consume the messages that were coming from the producer. So they should be somewhat in lockstep. You can see them generating things there, and we'll see the prices are just a little bit behind. If we go to the broker now, we can see that we've got um, a bunch of information about the queue. We've got the stock prices queue, how many messages are in there, 40, 40 unapped, great. So if I stop the producer now, that's the stop. We're not gonna get any more messages coming in. We've got 59. So this has stopped. The consumer is just waiting there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop that, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to the, the broker here. The queue has gone away. So the queue has disappeared. So one of the properties that we have of a queue is whether or not the queue is auto-delete. And when a queue's auto-deleted, it's, it's not, um, it only stays around for the channel that created it. So if you create a queue in a channel, and it's an auto-delete queue, then when the channel goes away, the queue goes away. One of the things that's really annoying, in this API here is having to remember what these parameters do because there's so many of them. So there's actually a new API that came out recently for the Rabbit team, which is you can create um, consume objects. And I'm gonna have to remind myself of the code for this. So what we're gonna do now, instead of just calling queue declare, is I'm gonna create a queue declare protocol object, and I'm gonna send it over the channel. And rather than have to remember what the, the, the things are, we use the builder pattern to have a much nicer API. So it's the queue, stock prices, auto delete true, build. Now I'm gonna make auto delete false. I'm gonna run the consumer. Okay, so nothing's happening because we've got no messages coming in. We'll start the publisher. And we can see the same in the consumer now. We've got the consumer here, messages coming through. We can see this in the queues back here now. All the same stuff's happening. What I want to do is stop the publisher, come to the consumer, and stop that. And the queue is still here. The queue hasn't gone away because we said this is not an auto-delete queue. I want it to stay around. But what's interesting is it's got, if you can see here, 31 messages marked as ready even though they were consumed, so we'd, we'd consumed them. And this is another nuance of, of uh, AMQP that isn't immediately apparent to people from JMS, is the way acknowledgement works. As a consumer, you have to acknowledge the message. There are two ways of doing this. One is, when you run your consume here, you can set it to auto-acknowledge, so every time you get a message, it's pre-acknowledged. I recommend not doing that, because it's actually acknowledged before it's sent to you down the wire. So it's kind of like pre-acknowledged even before you even see it. The best way to do it is to just simply call uh, ACK on the channel. So once you've got the message and you've done something with it, you can do um, the channel and you can do basic ACK. And it requires this long tag here, which is from the delivery object in the envelope delivery tag, and then you can choose whether or not to acknowledge all messages up until that point, true here, or just that message false here. So let's leave it to be false. And I need to add another exception here. So now when I run this, 
They see all the previous messages because they were not acknowledged. But when I come to the queue, they've gone. They're not, they've been acknowledged now, so they don't exist anymore. So I'm, I'm explicitly acknowledging that message with basic ACK. So the key thing there is, unless you either have auto ACK or you do an ACK, the message just stays on the queue. It's gonna be seen by the next consumer when your consumer goes away. So you need to do something about acknowledging the messages. Now, this is very simple stuff. It's not that dissimilar from JMS. The API is a bit different, but you can do this with JMS. There is support in Spring for declaring these as beans and having this all kind of started up for you. So it's not very interesting. Until you start to think about putting extra languages involved with this, when you want to start doing cross-language messaging, something you can't really do with JMS providers. So I'm gonna kick the consumer off. I really leave the consumer running. No messages are coming through. What I want to do now is build a very uh, simple publisher uh, in Erlang. So this is gonna be really easy. Um, don't worry if you don't know Erlang, it's really quite simple. Um, do I even have Erlang mode installed? No, I do not. Right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start a little Erlang process that's gonna run through generating messages, just like we did before. So um, the first thing I need to do is just set off the, uh, the random. Now, is that right? Yes. And then we need to spawn the process. And we do this by first creating the connection. You know what, we're running short on time. I'm gonna cheat. Always come prepared. So, we're gonna start, up, start a connection. API is almost the same, we start a connection, we open a channel, then we're gonna loop round sending messages on that channel and basically call this method here. I'm just gonna steal that from here. This is very similar now to the new API that exists um, in, the Java AP, in the Java client. And the reason we did the new Java client API was because people were having problems remembering those massive parameter lists. And as the protocol evolved, those parameter lists got longer and longer and longer, and it was getting harder to remember. So we did a very similar API to this. We have these objects which represent the protocol units. In this case, it's basic publish. And then we just send that on the channel. We sleep for 500 and then we, we do it again. So we're just gonna generate some prices. I've got a little utility library that generates the prices here. And the key thing that's different is we're gonna do some different stock symbols, Oracle, Microsoft, and HP. It's really easy to do. Uh, we can go into the AMQP publisher Erlang page. And then we can do Now that hasn't worked. Anyone know why? No? Good, because neither do I. Now, what I'm gonna do is quickly quit out of here. So how do you do that? Let's come back to the code. run it again and we can find out why it's not working. So we can come to the console and we can see if there's a connection made. Well there actually isn't a connection being made. Which is interesting. We can come to here and we can find out what's happening in the in the publisher. So what I'm gonna do is exit from here. always have a backup plan. Okay, I'm very frustrated by that. Okay, 
that is inexplicable to me. Okay, I'm gonna leave this for one second and we'll come back to it if we've got some time because there's clearly something going on there that's not apparent to me. What I want to show now quickly is if we use Stomp as well. So we can run Stomp in the AMQP broker, which is really easy. We can see from the broker here that we've got Stomp running, so I can connect to the Stomp uh, protocol, and that's fine. And I've written uh, a really simple consumer in Ruby, so we can just grab that from here. And then we're gonna just send some messages to this with a really easy little telnet command. This is our little stomp thing. We just create a connection, again, using the same password and host. Subscribe to a topic. This is a stomp topic, so these are different than AMQP. They're very much what you'd expect to see in, um, in JMS, and we're just gonna keep putting that out until we, until we receive it. So we'll come back a little bit. So that's just gonna wait there now until, it's, until it sees some messages. Um, what we can do is we can connect to the broker using Telnet because um, Stomp is just a really simple text protocol. So I can issue a connect frame myself. Uh, login guest, passcode guest, and then get the connected back. So I'm actually interacting with the broker using the Stomp protocol right now. And from the we said it's with the listening to topic stock prices, so we can send to that. And then we get that in our Ruby consumer. It's really basic stuff. It's just a simple text protocol that's, that's, that's in the broker. Where it becomes interesting is when we try to think about consuming messages in AMQP and publish them in Stomp or kind of vice versa. So we will come back to that at the end because I want to show you that you can mix those protocols together. Now, I've got one other quick thing I want to show you, which is the, uh, the Python client. Because Python's a language I think a lot of people are using for sysadmin, and there are a lot of interesting things you can get from the sysadmin space when you're publishing events about your DevOps, nodes up and down, that kind of stuff. And you can push them onto Rabbit and then consume them elsewhere aggregate them into your logging, reason about them. So it's really a nice little client to have. So let's come back again to the AMQP stuff, and that's in the consumer Python. So I've done the consumer this time, but you can do this any way you want to do. Um, let's run. Are we gonna get internet access is the question. Well, that's done loading in the background. We've got another demo we can do. Um, this is the best one. Is anyone familiar with Node.js? Okay, nobody. So Node.js is a server-side JavaScript framework. And it's basically designed to write network services in JavaScript that scale very well on the server. It runs on the V8 VM, the Google Chrome JavaScript VM. It has a very specific programming model. Everything is a non-blocking callback-based asynchronous I.O. operation. So you're not ever blocking. You're simply issuing a command and saying, here's my callback, call me when you're done. And people are building a lot of interesting things with this. In particular, a lot of people are doing the work for sending and streaming data to the browser in Node. They've got some kind of message broker like AMQP or JMS or whatever. They're connected to that from the Node client and then they're pushing notifications out to the server through Node as well. So let's see, have a see how that works. What we've got is um, we've got a simple Node server here. And I say simple, it's JavaScript, so it's kind of messy. Um, that's, kind of, that's my opinion, at least. 
rid of all this at the start. Okay, so this is what we got. Did I just do that twice? I think I did. So, it's very kind of messy code because there's a lot of callbacks involved, but effectively the way it works is this. There are a bunch of modules that you can, you can get from the module system. So we've got the HTTP module, the SOC.js module. SOC.js is another project from the Rabbit team which deals with streaming data to the browser using whatever is the best available capability that browser has. So if they've got web sockets, it'll do web sockets. If it's just got long polling, it'll do long polling. It degrades gracefully on the browser, so you can basically just deploy it and know that you'll be servicing a data to your browser as efficiently as you can. Um, because the internet here isn't fantastic, I'm actually serving this up locally, um, which was definitely a good move, I think. So we just need to know where SOC.js is, is being served. We create a server, so this is just an object that's running on the server, and we want to say that when we connect, again, everything is asynchronous. So even the server connecting and starting is asynchronous. By the time we get to line 11 here, the stock server might have connected, but it might not have. So we just have to do everything asynchronously. So we say, once you've connected, just give me this call back, and I want to connect to AMQP at that point in time. And what I want to do here is just create an AMQP connection, and when that's ready, I want to create a queue. And when that queue is ready, I want to bind. And then I want to subscribe. And then once I get every message back in, I want to write it out down the node channel to the browser. Everything is a callback. And you can see now why I said it's kind of messy. You don't really want to be doing everything in nested callbacks all the time. Some work is being done to deal with like a um, kind of a fibers based API. So it's, it's very easy for you to write synchronous code, but have it actually execute asynchronously in the background, but that's, that's newer work, so that's not really started yet. And then we've just got a bunch of kind of required stuff that's, that's there for node boilerplate. So I want to run this now um, from here. And we do this by just running node console.js. It seems like something else is running on that port and it's just dying for no reason. Okay, let's come back in here and change the port to something else. Okay, so that's running again now, which is kind of interesting. And I'm gonna get a very simple web page up now. And this is taking a while to load, and I think that's because the internet is, is, is funny here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna change that file quickly to use the local version of uh, SOC.js again. That's loaded now. Okay, so we've just got three boxes there waiting for some stock prices to arrive. If we go back and look at the code again, we can see how this is gonna work. What we've got is a node server that's listening for connections from the browser. And when a, when a, when a client connects, it's going to connect to AMQP on behalf of that uh, client. It's gonna create a new queue the empty arguments here for the queue name means just give me an exclusive queue, just generate a name, it's my queue, I just want it privately. And it's binding that queue to the AMQ direct exchange 
under the key stock prices. So any, any message that's sent to AMQ Direct with the key stock prices is going to find its way into this queue. And then in the node client, we subscribe to that queue and we just pass every message on to the browser client. So it's kind of acting like a proxy. That's all it's really doing. It's just a proxy for messages in the AMQP space to route them down to the browser. If we go to the browser page and we can see the node code here, we're just creating a SOP.js client side connection and then basically saying on every message, call the price function and that just updates the uh, appropriate HTML piece. I'm not a JavaScript whiz, so there's probably a million ways of doing that that are better. And we can see this by running the Java producer. Let's stop the consumer for a second. Run the publisher, and that's ticking away now. And we like, so we'd expect to see some things happening in the browser, but it's not happening, and there's a reason for this. And this is something that gets people, I think, every time. The default exchange, the empty one, is not equal to AMQ Direct. It's kind of a special exchange. It just provides you with a direct binding to every queue. So if you send a message to the, to the default exchange, the one with the empty name, then, and you put a queue's name as the routing key, that queue will get the message. It's kind of a special shortcut. You shouldn't really use it in anything other than just directly addressing a queue. But we're subscribed to the AMQ direct exchange here, and so we want to send messages there. So we can change our publisher, and in the publish task, we can just add AMQ direct in here. So that's really simple, I think. Um, let me run this again. Okay, so that's generating a bunch of messages. And they're coming through on the browser now, which I think is kind of cool. But we don't just want one client listening to that feed of events. You know, that's great stock prices to one place. We want multiple places to listen to it. So we can kind of go back and tweak some of our other clients to make them listen in the same way. So if we go to the, the Java consumer, we can make some slight changes here. Again, give me uh, an anonymous queue, declare that, and then bind it. Oh, crikey. Um, this is messiest thing about this client library is that we need to find out what the queue name is. So we can do that by casting this to a uh, queue. Declare OK. And then we can get the queue name from that. So that's the queue I want to bind, and I want to bind it on the exchange uh, AMQ dot direct with the routing key stock prices. Simple. And now we, the consumer will just basically uh, run for that binding, It'll run on that queue. We want to consume off the new queue that we just created, so this is a private queue. wrapped in an extra level of indirection when we get that back. So that isn't getting any messages now, and we need to find out why. So we can go into the, white, into the, into the uh, console here, and we can actually inspect all the bindings. So I can see the queues. These, this is what the kind of anonymous names look like. And I can explore all the bindings for these. So this has been bound to AMQ direct under stock prices. That's great. And this one has not, and neither has that. So we can go back here and find out why that's not been done. And it's quite a simple error, really. Um, we've constructed this object here, but we've not sent it to the, to, the, um, to the server. So we've got this new 
method do we want to send, but we're not actually sending it, so we can, we can fix that now. Okay, and we're just gonna send that to zero. And now we can see the price is coming through, which is really simple. And if we inspect again into the, into here, we should see one of these queues, whichever one it is, has got the, um, the binding now. So we've got two bound. So we've got one producer, two consumers, and I want to create some more. So what I really want to do is, if possible, I want to see those messages coming through in Stomp. Now this is, this is not the easiest thing to do. Um, you have to know some kind of internals, but we can subscribe to a special destination which is an exchange destination, and it's AMQ Direct, and we want to subscribe with the root and key stock prices. So this is an, basically this is a RabbitMQ extension to Stomp. We are subscribing using the Stomp protocol directly to a RabbitMQ destination. And now we're gonna start seeing the stock prices come through in Stomp, all from the Java producer. Um, and we're gonna revisit the Python one, because I'm gonna get that working now, because that was frustrating me. I have a sneaking suspicion it's just because I've got the ports wrong. No, that's okay. Oh, okay. I think it's because we haven't got internet access. You know, I went through all these demos beforehand and downloaded everything that I thought I needed. Clearly that didn't work out well. Well, let's give that another go at downloading and see if we can get the, the Python client to consume some messages um, any questions at this point while that's downloading? Peter. Yes, 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 yes. This is a really common question that people ask. We've got a direct exchange here, which is directly addressing queues. So we have a routing key, stock prices, which we can bind to any number of queues. So that means we can have multiple consumers. It's a very common pattern is to have a direct exchange with a key foo, and then for every consumer that wants to listen to messages on that, on that foo key, they can create their own topic, their own queue, and they can bind that queue to the key foo, and they can just listen. But it's not like they're consuming from the same queue, they're listening to the same key on the, re on the exchange. And this is very different in AMQP than it is in JMS. In JMS, you've got queues, which is one only delivery of a message to a consumer, or you've got topics, which is pub sub. And those are the two patterns you have. With AMQP, you can piece together the exchanges and the queues and the routing keys to create all number of patterns. So the kind of common pub sub mechanism is done with a direct exchange, a key representing the topic, and a queue per consumer. Does that make sense? It's very different. It's very unusual in the way it's done. Okay, so, yeah, and then, you, so the, quest of the second question there is why not use a topic exchange or a fan-out exchange? A fan-out exchange is really nice because you have an exchange that's named and it just sends messages to all queues that are bound to it irrespective of the routing key. That's really nice and you could do that and you could create an exchange per topic, but it's more common, I think, to use a routing key for a topic on one exchange. It's less common to create many, many exchanges. A topic uh, exchange could be used, but you'd only use that if you wanted pattern-based routing. If you wanted to say, bind me to all routing keys that match stock.star, and then you were sending out messages with stock.ibm, stock.oracle, stock.google, and you could route messages appropriately that way. It's only if you want pattern-based routing. So, we've got a few more minutes, and I'm hoping the Python thing is downloaded. It has, and it's consuming. So we've got Python, we've got loads of stuff going on there. I've got one more demo, because I want to get one more producer in here now. This is my favorite one. Let's get another tab open. This is the one that's interesting to me the most, because I'm very interested in the notion that we can um, use the right language for the right job. And a language that really appeals to me is Haskell. 
which people are going to snigger at now. And the reason I like Haskell is because for some parts of the system that I'm working on, I really want to have that level of preciseness, that level of checking at the command line. I've become what I think is probably a type snob now. To me, Java and Ruby and Groovy and Python are all the same. They're all just loosely typed languages. If you compare Haskell, which is extremely strongly typed, you can actually embody behavior in the type system. So in my business, one of the things we do is credit risk scoring. Well, we're interested in getting that right, and we're interested in being able to embody behavior in the type system so that when we write new parts of the risk checking or when we write new rules, that we can get extra benefit from the type system. So I like to pass things around between Haskell and between Ruby and between Python, so I'm very interested in Haskell. So we've got a very basic outline of this here, a bunch of um, what look like variables but are actually functions, um, host, vhost, so on and so forth, just the connection parameters that we need to connect to, um, to the broker, I'm just gonna change this to be uh, something slightly different than what we've got. Let's do MSFT. And then, because we are somewhat short on time, I think, I'm gonna um, pull this in from here. Does anyone here actually use Haskell? Nice. A one guy, obviously. Um, it's really quite an easy language to, to learn. Um, I know everyone has the scary notion that we, we have to learn advanced mathematics, which isn't really true. You can pretty much get by. So we have a main function, which is just our entry point into the program. We create a connection, we create a channel. We get a bunch of random tickers. We'll come back to that in a second because it's an interesting part of why you might want to use Haskell. And then we just pu publish those tickers on the channel. And the way we work here is we just say, this is a, a, a matching expression. If anyone's using Scala, they'll be familiar with this. It's basically a list match. So it says, give me the head element, and then give me as ticker, and give me the rest of the list as something called rest. And I can publish a message on that channel, which is just the current, that ticker, sleep for a short period, and then recurse and do it again. The kind of interesting bit is this. Um, this is generating an infinite list of random stock tickers that is lazily evaluated. So I can keep asking for more elements, and more elements will appear, it's, it's infinite, but I don't have to store that whole thing in memory. The, the, the elements are lazily reified, and then when I don't use them anymore, they're forgotten about. It's a really nice way of just generating streams and streams of data. So we can run this in now. If I could save that link. And we should be able to go to one of the consumers and see that extra stuff coming through. We're not seeing the extra stock tickers. Does anyone know why? Again, it's the strange notion of the default exchange versus the, um, the, the direct exchange. This is something that I keep doing on purpose to try and make the comment that it's a very common problem you'll face. And I'll show you, basically, our exchange here is the empty exchange, but we're, we're bound to the AMQ direct exchange. Very easy when you first have to get involved with AMQP to use the default exchange all the time because it helps you get like a JMS style API. But then when you start using AMQP stuff, you start using different exchanges, and then it gets a bit messy. My recommendation is just to start by using the normal exchanges as much as you can, and kind of trying to use the exchange and queue and routing key structure to have some meaning in your business, to embody something. So we'll just give this a run again. And let's come to the Java consumer, and now we can see the HP and all those kind of things coming in there. Uh, if I had more boxes on the fancy node thing here, we'd, we could see them coming up as well. And this is really quite simple. You know, there's not a lot of code involved with this, but we've got Haskell and Java and Node and Ruby all working together. We've got a little Telnet client that we can use to uh, snoop what's been going on with the, with the Stomp adapter. And we're sending multi-language, multi-protocol messages. And we've probably got 300 lines of code in total. Not, not a lot of meaningful stuff there. It just works so easily because the broker is doing all the hard work. It's doing all the messaging model and protocol and, and language bindings. It's all done for you out of the box with Rabbit. Um, any more questions at this point? No? Then I quickly want to just recap those routing key no, uh, notions because I know that they're, they're difficult to, to understand. 
So we go back to, and we can look at this now in the context of the code that we had. So we have the consumers, the consumer and comes the big along, grateful. and it's like, fine, I'll take that message. What really is the, is the thing here is that no acknowledge message is sent to more than one consumer. So the acknowledgement is your reliability mechanism as a consumer to say, yep, I'm done with that now, the broker can forget about it. This is different than JMS because there are no, there's no real transactional model. You can use transactions if you want, but it's not recommended. It's more a transfer of responsibility model. At the consume side, you're saying, yes, I accept responsibility for this message now. The broker can forget about it, and that's what the acknowledge does. On the produce side, you've got these exchanges. You can create any exchange you want of any type. There's a couple of exchanges by default. There's the, the default exchange that we saw, has no name, and all it does is route messages directly to queues by their name. Very simple. There's the AMQ direct exchange, which just does direct queue to routing key bindings. Very simple. There's a transfer of responsibility model here as well. There's no transaction for the publish. Instead, what you do is you send a message to the broker, and it will tell you, it will acknowledge to you when it's accepted the message. And depending on whether or not the queue is persistent and whether the message is persistent, that will happen quicker or, or slower. And there are different guarantees. For example, if you have durable queues and you send persistent messages to there, then you'll get an acknowledgement once the broker has written that message to disk and has f-synced, so you know it's safe on disk, or it's been delivered. So you know the responsibility has been transferred. And the, the piece that holds this all together is the bindings. It's the bindings that matter. You can say bind exchange AMQ direct to Q foo with key bar. And when somebody sends a message to the key bar, it goes to that queue. You can bind any number of queues to a given key on an exchange, and that's how you can create the topic style routing where you want people to listen to a subject. The subject, the topic name, is the routing key, not the queue name. And this is probably the biggest difference between AMQ, uh, between AMQP and JMS. In JMS, we're used to using the destination name to have meaning. It's the destination name, the topic name, or the queue name that has the meaning. Whereas in AMQP, it's typically the routing key that has the meaning. The queues are somewhat unimportant. The routing key is structured for some particular types of exchange. So as we, uh, you know, we saw the AMQP direct one, which is just a string, but you can use topic exchanges to do pattern-based matching. And those things are easy to do about. This presentation is all online. You can find me on the Twitters. Uh, occasionally talking about MQP and Rabbit and Ruby and stuff, uh, and all this code is online. And I've only shown a fraction of the language bindings that work here. It's PHP, OCaml, Lua, languages that I don't even know at all that exist for bindings for AMQP, and even more for Stomp, because Stomp is such a simple protocol. I don't think I've ever seen a protocol that I could actually type into Telnet to do messaging with and actually get something meaningful out the back of it, but it does really work. A lot of our testing and a lot of our exploration with Stomp has been done with Telnet or Netcat or something like that, and it, and it does work very well. Uh, any questions before we finish? No? Well, thank you very much.